Let's go through some simple tips and tricks to help you shoot good quality video assignments using your phone. Start by planning your video. Think about who your intended audience is and the purpose of your assignment. Your intended audience is important. If you're speaking to a group of your peers, you may use a more conversational tone and informal setting. Other assignment types or audiences may require more formality. Just like any good presentation, you should know what it is you want to say before you start shooting. When you are presenting in person, you might be able to read the room. Watching your audience can help you to know when to elaborate on a point, or when you may be getting off track. When making a video, you can't get this kind of live feedback, so it's important to start with a script. A script will ensure that you don't miss any important points that you want to make. A script will also keep you from repeating yourself. If you improvise, your video may be too wordy, or you may leave in too many pauses while thinking about what to say next. Don't use connecting phrases like, so then, or as previously mentioned. You can do this in written assignments to make connections, but it doesn't sound natural in the spoken word. Try to keep your script short and concise. People tend to lose interest if videos drag on for too long. Make sure you check your criteria for video length. If you plan to make a complex video, you should consider storyboarding to ensure you don't miss any shots. Storyboarding can help you to plan the visual elements that will accompany your script. Your video may include a combination of text, photos, graphics, audio, and video. Storyboards can be simple documents or drawings, and normally include a sketch of your shot, the time you intend your shot to last for, and a transcript of the accompanying video. When you're planning your video, it can be tempting to map out many different shots and camera angles to keep things engaging. My advice is to be conservative, as the more shots you decide to include, the more editing you will need to do. Footage can take up a lot of storage space on your phone. If you use up your storage, you will be unable to shoot anymore until you've cleared it. Before you shoot, think about what you're going to do with your footage. There are three main ways to store your footage. You may choose to use an external storage device that you can plug into your phone, such as a USB key or SD card. This gives you quickly accessible internal storage. However, devices like these can be costly, and if you lose them, you may lose all of your footage. You could remove footage from your phone and store it on your computer. Always ensure you're using your student file storage, that is your H drive, when you're using a UQ computer. This reduces the risk of losing your files, as library computers regularly clear leftover files from all other folders. You can upload your footage to a cloud storage provider. Some providers include Google Drive, Dropbox, Microsoft OneDrive, or Apple iCloud. Cloud storage reduces the risk that you'll lose your footage, as it can be quickly backed up and accessed from anywhere. However, most cloud storage has limits, and you may need to use multiple providers to hold all of your footage or pay for additional space. My recommendation is that you use a combination of storage methods that suit your budget, and always keep a backup in cloud storage, just in case. Always keep an eye on your phone battery. Wherever you're shooting, try to have an option for charging. Portable power banks can be very helpful. Make sure your screen brightness is turned up as much as possible, so that you can get a clear idea of what your footage really looks like. If you're comfortable risking it, you may choose to take your phone out of its case, to limit interference with the camera and microphone. Before you shoot, you should choose the orientation of your footage, depending on what you're planning to use it for. Vertical video can be great for social media, but it's difficult to watch on a computer or projector. A selfie cam can feel personal, informal, and inviting in the right setting, but can also look unprofessional compared to a fixed camera. However you choose to do it, make sure that the orientation, style, and tone of your video is consistent. The secret to shooting good quality video from your phone is lighting. As phones have smaller image sensors and lenses than professional cameras, Proper lighting is very important. Phone cameras struggle to focus when filming in low light, especially at night. The best lighting is bright but diffuse, like the middle of an overcast day. It isn't necessary to purchase professional lighting equipment. Take advantage of natural light sources, such as windows. Torches and lamps can produce a nice light. If your light sources are too intense, you should try to diffuse the light. You can do this by reflecting the light off a textured surface, such as a wall or covering the light with a thin sheet or piece of paper. Try to shoot in brightly lit areas without pointing the camera directly into light sources, as this will cause lens flare, washed out footage, or a silhouetted subject. Avoid harsh sunlight, as this creates harsh shadows. 
Image sensors in phone don't react well to dramatic changes in lighting, such as flashing lights at a concert or moving between areas of brightness and shadow. Dramatic changes in lighting can trigger automatic exposure control, which will defocus and refocus your image, so keep your lighting consistent. A typical lighting setup when filming a person is three-point lighting. This is when three light sources are used. Two light sources in front of the subject light them up from either side, and one light source from behind makes them appear distinct from the background. Lighting from multiple angles limits shadows and gives the camera plenty of data to work with. Don't rely on your phone flash for lighting. Some phones will include a grid overlay in the video settings. This grid splits the screen into nine parts with evenly spaced lines. You may want to use this grid to help you align your shot. Positioning your point of interest or subject at the intersection of two of these lines will help you create a more balanced composition. In photography, this is known as the rule of thirds. Regardless of whether or not you use a grid, you should try to keep your shot balanced. Take the time to notice areas of high contrast, bright light, and rich color. The eye of your viewer will be drawn to these areas. If you're filming someone talking, you should keep their whole head and face in frame and in focus. Consider who is being addressed by the person being filmed. If you're filming an interview, you should shoot to imply that the person being filmed is talking to someone off camera. You can do this by angling the shot slightly to the side. Your subject should speak to a fixed point and not look down the lens of the camera. On the other hand, if the person on camera is speaking directly to the audience watching the video, they should try to look into the lens as much as possible, as if they're making eye contact with the audience. Looking into the lens will make for a much more engaging video. The quality of your audio is more important than the quality of your video. Your audio must be clear at the right volume and free of distractions. This is particularly important if you're filming a presentation. When filming outside, strong wind and other environmental noise can be distracting or drown out important audio. Your phone case may also distort sound recording. The best solution is to record your sound inside, in a quiet space with little or no ambient noise. Try to find a room without air conditioning, or with sound absorbing objects like curtains to reduce echo. Ensure you aren't too close to your microphone, or it could pick up sounds such as breathing, mouth noises, and plosives or pops. If you need to stand further away from your camera, you may be able to use an external microphone, such as a set of wireless headphones. You could also try recording audio from another source, such as a second phone placed nearby. Depending on the editing app you've chosen, you may be able to synchronize a separate audio track. You should make sure you're comfortable doing this before you commit to using an external microphone. You may choose to record audio only and combine it with a video or slideshow in editing as I'm doing now. This will allow you to position yourself and your phone however you need to for the best quality audio. You should check whether your assignment criteria allows you to use a voiceover or whether you're required to be on camera. It's important to be consistent with your audio quality, as cuts between audio clips are more jarring than cuts in video. There are a lot of factors you need to balance when filming on your phone. When taking a long or complex shot, it's possible for phones to overheat and shut down or run out of space, which may cause you to lose all or part of your recording. Stopping and starting your video can make it look jumpy and inconsistent, especially if it requires you to approach and move away from the camera with each new shot. You may need to experiment with your phone's filming capabilities to get it right. It's good practice to get a couple of takes for everything you need. This gives you a safety net if you make a mistake and gives you more options for editing. For this reason, it's also a good idea to get extra shots of your environment or your subject that you can substitute in if there's a problem with some of the footage. The more shots you take, the more storage space you will use, the longer you'll spend editing, and the more complex editing will be. Always give yourself a time frame to film, and remember to leave plenty of time for editing your footage. Phone cameras are tiny, so it's best to be close to the subject you're filming. Most phones rely on digital zoom, which is just a software trick that makes your subject appear closer while sacrificing quality. Newer phones often include more than one camera, allowing you to use good quality optical zoom. If you're dedicated, you may choose to purchase clip-on lenses that give you more options. Most phones have built-in stabilization, but using both hands to keep your phone steady when carrying it goes a long way. While there are stabilizers out there you can purchase, your camera will be most reliable when your phone is mounted on a stable surface or tripod. 
your phone camera will have optional advanced settings. These may include locking exposure or focus. If you're confident, you should experiment with these features. Depending on what model of phone you're using, you should be able to select a point of focus by tapping on or pressing a point on your screen. If you're filming yourself, you may want a friend to help out and make sure that you're in frame, in focus, and well lit. You should pay close attention to your camera options, particularly frame rate and resolution. These factors determine how information dense your video is. Frame rate indicates the number of frames that appear per second of a video. This will most likely be set to 30 frames per second by default, although this could vary depending on your device. A higher frame rate means more frames are displayed per second. The higher your frame rate, the smoother your video will appear. A very high frame rate can also be used to apply a slow motion effect to your video in editing. Some phones have a slow motion shooting option, which may record at 120 or 240 frames per second. You should always take care that the editing software you've chosen can process the frame rate that you select. Your resolution determines the size and shape of video you shoot. The most common resolution is 1080p, also known as full high definition. Filming in this resolution ensures that your video will retain its quality on a large screen. Some newer phones also allow you to shoot in 4K or ultra high definition. Shooting in 4K will take up about four times the space of equivalent footage in 1080p and may limit your editing options. I'd recommend filming in 1080p unless you're looking to preserve very fine details in your film. You may need to go into your phone's settings and make sure filming in 1080p is enabled. Editing can be a big challenge. There are plenty of videos on YouTube with tips and tricks on video editing. UQ students and staff also have access to LinkedIn Learning, which contains tutorials for software such as Adobe Premiere Pro. You can install Premiere Pro on library computers or download a free trial for your personal computer from the Adobe website. If you're worried about using this software, you may find it easier to edit your video on your phone. There are plenty of free apps you can use to put together your video. It's a good idea to explore your options carefully before you start shooting, as the app you choose to edit with may determine what you're able to include in your video. Some apps limit the number of shots you can include, limit the quality of your final video, or place watermarks over the footage. Some apps include video filters, special effects, and may even support adding voiceover or a music track. You should decide what features are important to you and determine how much you're willing to pay before you proceed with any editing app. Always watch out for free apps that seem too good to be true because they probably are. It's always a good idea to make a short test video in your chosen app to catch any issues early. Make sure you leave yourself plenty of time for editing. You should leave enough time to reshoot parts of your video if necessary. When you've finished editing your video, you'll need to render your footage. Rendering is the process of converting your project file which may include several video and audio clips, into one combined video. Until you've rendered your video, you usually can't watch it using any other programs. Rendering your video doesn't get rid of your project files, and you can always continue to edit your video and export it again at a later time. Always make sure that the video you output is using settings that match your footage to maximize quality. For example, if you shot your footage in 1080p 60 frames per second, you should ensure that these are the quality settings of your render, if you have the option. Always make sure to check your rendering options in your editing app before you commit to it, as watermarks are fairly common, particularly in free software. Rendering your footage will create a new video file. There is no universal standard for video file types. You should always make sure to watch your new video file outside of your editing app to make sure it will work where you need it to. Try sending your finished video to a friend to test if it looks right to them. Give yourself time to watch through and correct your video if needed. This is the right time to think about whether your video needs captions. Captions are an excellent option if you're worried about your audio or your pronunciation. It's also best practice to provide captions for accessibility. Captions can be hard-coded or open, meaning that they always display and cannot be turned off. These captions are added in the video editing stage. Your editing app may give you the option to add subtitles. Alternatively, captions can be closed, which allows the viewer to turn them on and off as needed. These captions are added after your video is rendered and are commonly used on TV and websites like YouTube and Vimeo. If you're uploading your video to a website, you should look into whether a captioning system is available. 
YouTube uses speech recognition technology to automatically generate captions, however these are not always accurate. You should keep your script to make transcribing captions easy. For more information on producing videos for your assignments, visit the Assignment Essentials pages on the UQ Library website.